Hi, welcome to the breadboard. I have another mailbag for you today. This time it is three products from a company called 52 Pi, online store specializing in Raspberry Pi accessories and other products. They approached me a while ago about having a look at some of their products for review and to use in my projects, so I selected three. What I have here to show you today is a five inch capacitive touch HDMI screen a GPS module with a serial USB connection, so easy to interface to the Raspberry Pi virus USB port, and an ADS-1115 from Texas Instruments. This is a quad-channel 16-bit analog to digital converter with programmable gain. Uh, that's all on one nice little board, and we'll have a look at that in a second. So without further ado, let's just get to the uh, close-up of the bench and have a look at these, and then we will get them installed on the Raspberry Pi and have a look at how easy it is to use and get them up and running, you know, programming-wise with the HD converter. Let's give it some signals, see how um, it fares with that, and see how well we can interface these things to Node-RED, which is one of my favorite IoT-based platforms for um, control, whether it's home automation or industrial automation or whatever. So let's go have a look. Okay, so what we have here, these are the three boxes that the products arrived in. Um, we have the 5-inch HDMI LCD capacitive touch screen, 800 by 480 resolution, and it supports 60 frames per second which is pretty good has multi-touch um, it has free driver now that doesn't mean that it comes with an sd card or anything like that with drivers on what it's really meaning is that you don't need to load any drivers it's fully supported right out of the box with windows xp through windows 10 uh, linux and even android um, will work with a raspberry pi beaglebone black um, banana pi a pc a mac basically anything that can output an hdmi uh, signal. So that's the first item. We'll have a look at that. Let's just pull it out of the box here. So it comes with a leaflet, gives you a uh, quick start guide, some FAQs about setting it up, and a um, yeah, just more of the summary of the descriptions. Uh, nothing on the back of that. Um, how to change some settings with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, if it doesn't show up properly, for instance, on here, you've got a bit clipping on the right hand side, etc, uh, etc. Et and then comes down at the bottom to a link um, on the Wikipedia for the 52 Pi um, site to get more information. So we'll have a look at that in a moment as well. It requires two things by the look of it, a USB lead to connect, I would assume, the touchscreen, yep, and the HDMI. So in the box, what we have is, nicely protected here, is the 5-inch LCD screen. Uh, big piece of plastic protecting the screen here. Uh, it's not framed. Uh, with you know some of the screens these days come with a plastic bezel around them So this doesn't have that it does have four mounting holes one in each corner so that you could mount it into a case um, On the back of the board we have the standard set of chips for driving it One of these is going to be a touch controller. One of them is going to be HDMI to um, the LCD screen driver converter um, one of these has got its um, information laser etched off, so you can't see what chip this is. Uh, not that it really matters. The main thing here is we've got the HDMI input and we've got the uh, USB connection. I would assume the USB also provides the power for the screen. I don't see any other connections for power, so that must be it. We've got the cable running out to the LCD display, and I'm assuming this one is probably the multi-touch um, capacitive touchscreen interface going off to the front of the panel. And that's pretty much it as far as that's concerned. There's nothing else in the box that I can see. So what that means is you'll have to get your own HDMI lead and also get your own USB lead. Not that that's necessarily a big deal for the USB, but HDMI leads, if you're putting the Pi close to this, 
Um, I happen to have an HDMI lead here, but it's pretty big and bulky. So you might want to, you know, if you're putting it to, all into a case or something, you might want to get a uh, smaller HDMI lead, maybe a lightweight one that you can just have uh, maybe six inches long or something like that, just whatever it is to suit your needs. Um, I have a Raspberry Pi 3 ready to do some checking with. Uh, I have a uh, SD card already prepared with the latest Raspbian. I think that's Stretch. Um, I have a uh, keyboard ready for setting up and things like that and a wireless dongle for the keyboard. So that's pretty much everything I'm going to need for testing out the display. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's just put this aside a second. So the next thing we have is the ADS-111580 C module. This is for the um, B, 2B, 3B, A, and 0 Raspberry Pi. So pretty much anything that has uh, probably the 40 pin header on it. So the only thing in the box is the ADC module. Let's just take this out of the bag. So it's quite a neat small package uh, in an anti-static bag for obvious reasons. So what we have on the board here is something from top left, a header with four um, connection options. This looks like it's to set the address between 48, 49, 4A and 4B. Um, we have an NTC on here. I'm assuming this is probably connected to one of the channels. Uh, looks like analog zero. So right now there's a jumper in there which has it enabled. So I'm assuming there's probably a little uh, volt to the NTC uh, to the analog in and then to ground. So there's like a potential divider to the ADC for channel zero. We have connections for, uh, let's have a look, ground, 3.3 volts, analog zero, one, two, and three. So the 3.3 volts is probably to go out to some external circuitry, not for feeding in. And then we had the 40 pin header, which is why it excludes some of the previous Raspberry Pis that don't have the 40 pin. The earlier ones only had a 34, I think it was. And the last thing, a little bit of information on here, resolution 16 bits, data rate, anything between eight and 860 samples per second. Uh, you've got compensation, uh, sorry, a comparator and a programmable gain amplifier. Um, we'll have a look at that more in the software. You, I know from experience you can um, have full scale of the 16 bits or anything from a few hundred millivolts right up to in excess of six volts. Um, you can use differential inputs between any two of the channels and also single ended inputs between channel one through four. So how you configure that depends on your application. It has four screws so that you could probably mount it onto something um, or obviously, you know, it's small enough. You can just plug this straight on the top of the Raspberry Pi. So we will have a look at that in just a moment. So last but not least is the Raspberry Pi USB GPS module with TTL port. So let's Open this one up and check this one out. So we have the GPS module and we have a USB cable. Standard micro USB. And so what we have here is the board for the GPS module. On the top, we have the USB connector. Looks like we have protection diode, uh, probably a um, USB to serial adapter, maybe a CP2102 or something like that. Uh, battery, probably for retaining some of the configuration for the GPS so that uh, when it powers up, it can probably quickly track uh, satellites that have already been used. Looks like there's an option for an external antenna here, but obviously looking at this, that does have a GPS uh, antenna actually on the top. There's looks like a stacked um, module here with the main circuitry on the bottom and an antenna on the top. Um, often you'll find these antenna sections, this beige piece, uh, as a separate unit. And what we also have on the side is a TTL, looks like, um, TTL port 2 if you wanted to use that instead of the USB. 
uh, on the back of the board? Well, nothing. So that's all there is to that. So let me just clear the bench. I've got a uh, Raspberry Pi ready to go. Okay, so everything is assembled. The SD card's plugged into the Pi. The ADC module is plugged into the 40 pin header. The USB module, um, GPS module, is plugged in via USB cable to the Raspberry Pi. The second connection of this particular USB port pair goes to the touch screen um, of the 5 inch LCD display, HDMI cable routing through to the Raspberry Pi, and I have a Wi Fi, sorry, a wireless dongle for my keyboard for the moment because we need to enable SSH before we can remotely access this. Um, so that's everything except plugging in power to the Pi. So let's look at doing that and what we should get is the normal Pi startup but on the LCD display. Let me see if I can tip this up a little bit so that there's no glare on it. That might work. There we go, I hope. Let's just move the Pi a little bit further forward so it's not blocking the screen and I think that is it. So the Pi, by the way, was provided by RS Components um, at no charge for me to do some of my projects with, along with a 5 volt 2 amp um, power adapter, just right for the Raspberry Pi. So let's get that plugged in and get this thing powered up. So it looks like the five inch display is working quite nicely. It's just done a boot up and reconfigured the SD card. Now it's booting up for real. It's, I'm not speeding up the video here at all. And there it is completely booted up. Now, one of the things that was mentioned in the notes here for the Raspberry Pi is if you do get this kind of configuration, it's because the Raspberry Pi is still trying to use uh, the wrong resolution. So what we need to do is go into the config.txt file, make these corrections, and then boot it up again. So let me just power this down and we'll go to my computer and make the corrections. Be right back. Okay, changes have been made. So let's power this back up again and hopefully this time it will give us the full width of the screen. Now, the changes I've made are exactly what are mentioned here in this document. So set the frame buffer width to 800, 480 for the height, forced HDMI hot plug, HDMI group two, HDMI mode 87, and HDMI CVT parameters. So that's all I've done right now, not touched anything else. So let's just power this back up and see if it works. I actually did the editing with my Windows PC because the boot partition um, and folder is actually made part of the root when you plug it in with Windows. And it's mapped in when it boots up. And there we have it. One of the things I am very impressed with with the new uh, Raspberry Pi stretch is how fast it boots up. It takes a matter of seconds, uh, as you can see right there. Uh, now, I haven't done anything else, and you can see here with the screen. First of all, it looks very nice, but the touch screen is working perfectly. Um, you can select things quite easily. So let's just go into preferences now. I'm just using my finger, Raspberry Pi config. And let's set up a few things. So we want to have I2C because the chip on here uses I2C. This is USB, so we don't need the TTL serial enabled. But what I am going to do, though, is um, just enable I2C. I will turn on SPY while we're at it. Um, I also want SSH enabled so that we can do this remotely after we finish looking at the screen here. And reboot needed, so we'll just say yes. And we've got some reflections on there again. OK, 
Okay. And we're back up. Now SSH is enabled, but we don't have a password set. So let's just move this over and we'll say OK. So we're good to go there. Now let's set up some Wi-Fi so that I can remotely access this. OK, so we need the Oaks Clan network or Oaks Clan home. And we put in our shared key and we should get a connection. And there we go. So while a five inch screen works very, very well, as you can see, and I think for a lot of HMI type applications, this will be fine. It is um, a tad small when you're trying to do some operations. Uh, so we're nicely connected to my network. Um, most of this stuff is working fine, but let's just bring up a browser for a second just to see. So bring up Chromium browser. Yep, that seems to be okay. But the one thing it doesn't do, of course, is bring up a uh, on-screen keyboard. So you'd have to load Matchbox or something like that to be able to do that. But that's okay. Um, that's what you have wireless keyboards for and things. Also, in the applications that I have in mind, uh, I'd probably be starting an automatic browser session and using a Node-RED dashboard or OpenHAB set up for um, a touch screen, not needing actual keyboard input and things like that. So anyway, let's get to the PC now and we will look at setting up uh, Node-RED because I want to use Node-RED to talk to the I2C bus and to the GPS module, um, but first of all we need to do a couple of tests to make sure that we can see them. Now theoretically based on these jumpers, the I2C uh, ADC module should be on address 48 and the GPS, from what I understand, should already be streaming out serial data about once every second out to whatever COM port has been set up for this, probably USB 0, um, but we'll check that out as well. So let's go over there and do some more work from there. So before we go have a look at the sample applications I'm going to set up, let's have a quick look at the 52Pi website and what the details of the devices are. So here's the home page, it's www.52pi.com and the first thing we're looking at here is a bunch of obviously ads and stuff like that, but what we're interested in uh, first of all, the nice new screen, and here it is on the home page. It's a new device. So $59.99, that's US dollars. Uh, resolution, etc. You click in here, you go to uh, some more details of the board. There's also a wiki page that you can have a look at. I happen to have it here, which gives you a bit more information, how to cook it up, um, some additional information about its touch capabilities, and some uh, few other things that you may need to do if you want to set up resolution automatically and stuff like that. But the manual process that I did before is quite sufficient to get this thing working. So anyway, you can have a look here. I'll provide a link to this page for you if you need it. Um, the second device which we want to look at is under Raspberry Pi and it will be a breakout board. And right up top, 16-bit I2C ADS1115 module. This is the one that we have. We'll go in and have a quick look. Again, like I've already mentioned, 16-bit resolution, 4-channel. Uh, has a thermistor on board with a jumper so you can enable or disable it. Um, internal programmable gain amplifier. It's got a built-in voltage reference, etc. These, these are all features of the ADS1115 from Texas Instruments and it just plugs right on top of the Pi. Again, there is a wiki page for this right here. Um, gives you a whole bunch of information including schematics, 
We also have further down some data on how to set up the device. Um, you can actually get a uh, daemon running, which is what one of the things that we will do. Um, because the device itself, the GPS module, will be sending data continuously uh, through the serial connection via the USB to the Pi. Having a daemon to take care of that, and then we can just pull the daemon for its information, just makes things a little easier. So the one we're going to use here is from Adafruit, I think. We're also going to look on the Node Red node because we're going to try and drive this through to Node Red. Uh, anyway, we'll go through that in just a moment for setting it up, but it's all the information is here. Again, I'll provide the link. And then the last module is the GPS module. Um, this should show up as a TTL port, and we will have to configure it to use 9600 board as well by using the STTY-F command, specify the port, and the fact that we want to have it running on 9600 board. I know that doesn't necessarily say that here, but from experimentation, oh, here it is. So board rate, 9600 is the default. So you could probably talk to the GPS module and change its board rate. I'm just going to leave it at 9600 for now. Uh, and just get the information from it. So that's all good stuff. So anyway, I'll provide the link for this as well. So let's get to um, WinSCP and connect to the board. So here is WinSCP. I've already uh, configured it. Um, my board happens to be running on uh, .143 IP address on my local network, and I have a TTY session that I've got that I've just logged into. Now if you run I2C detect with a dash Y so it doesn't ask you questions and on uh, I2C bus 1 it should give us a map of all the I2C devices it can find. If it is finding the ADC 1115 it should show up on location 48. And there it is. So that's good news. We're seeing our I2C device. Now, for the GPS module, if we look in um, slash dev slash just slash dev, and we do an ls tty star, here's all the TTY devices, and here is our TTY USB device. So it's shown up as USB 0. Now, because I had a camera failure, for some reason my Windows machine decided to install the USB devices and my microphone is USB based. Uh, I had already done some of these commands prior to this, um, no more than what I'm already showing you, but I had already adjusted the um, TTY port to run at 9600 board. So when you connect to it, if you do a um, cat slash dev slash TTY USB 0 um, and in this case it's probably going to work just fine but if it doesn't and it just sits there with nothing or garbage um, then you just need to run the command STTY dash F I'll uh, put it up on the screen for you um, specify the device name slash dev slash TTY USB 0 or whatever it may be in your case and then the board rate and then if you try catenating from the device again, it should work. So here's what you should get. So as you can see there, I'm getting NEMA data streamed from the GPS device to my Raspberry Pi via the USB port. Now, this is not going to be capturing a signal right now because I'm in the basement and it won't be able to get a lock on any satellites. So before we're done, I will move it up to a location where it can and we'll remote connect to it so that we can get a signal and we'll have a look at the data that comes out. So this is the data that's coming out right now. As I said, there is no satellite lock at the moment though. Um, the commands that I had to run to, um, to update this, because it was a brand new fresh install of uh, Raspberry Pi using the stretch version, and these are the commands that I've run up to now. So we've got the STTY-F to set the board rate, of USB 0. 
I've ran the standard sudo apt-get update upgrade, which took a little while. Um, I then installed npm because it was not installed by default on the Raspberry Pi for some reason. Uh, so I've installed that, and even though Node Red is included with the Raspberry Pi, I wanted to update it to the latest version. So I reran the npm install Node Red and did a dash g to make it global. Once that was done, I ran the command system control enable Node Red service so that it will automatically start for me. And then I just started Node Red. Now I've just um, got to the point now where I'm actually going to um, start Node Red. So we'll just do node dash red dash start. And Node Red should start up. Now, normally with a reboot, I haven't rebooted yet, um, this would start automatically. So this step would not normally be necessary. Okay, so Node Red is now running on port 1880. So if I bring up a browser page here, a fresh one, so we're on port one, uh, we're on IP address 143, so 192.168.1.143, colon 1880, we should get Node Red screen show up. And here we have it. So this is the default, no modules have been installed yet. Um, and if we look over here, we should be able to see that we're running Node Red version 17.5, which is great. If we look on the left hand side, we have all of the standard um, inputs, output nodes, functions, uh, social storage, and advanced, including the Raspberry Pi GPIO. Now, what we need to do is add the dashboard and also ADS1115 modules and we'll also add a GPS module because I happen to know that there is one that will work with our GPS. So we haven't um, installed the daemon yet so let's just get this going and then we'll go and install the daemon. So within Node Red with the later version you can actually manage the palette from right within Node Red. Um, so these are the ones that are currently installed. We want to install some new ones. So we click on install, put in the search. So first thing we want is ADS1115. Uh, and here we, do, here we go. So here is one that will handle that for us. Updated six months ago. So we'll just click install for this. Uh, install it. Now if you want to have some information on this, you can click on this little link here. And it will take you to the uh, Node Red flows and nodes website where it will give you some more information. So that's now done. We've got a node added for the ADS1115. Uh, now I want to also add something for the GPS. So I'll just type in GPS and see what comes up. So GPSD. So this is the one we want and we actually have to install the daemon yet for this. So we'll do that in just a moment. So we'll just click install for this. Now we can't use this one of course until we have the daemon running. So that's that one done. Now we also want the node red dashboard. This allows us to create some web pages very very easily. So this this one down here was updated oh quite recently 11 hours ago. So we just click install for this one. We say install uh, give that a few moments to go through. And then that should be done for our te the drivers that we need for the nodes for the Node Red GPS and Node Red ADS1115 modules. Okay, so that's that one done. So we just say close here. Now, if we refresh or look down here, we can see as an input we now have the ADS1115. Uh, we should also be able to find um, there's the dashboard pieces. So we need to go to um, a terminal session again here. And if we look under the GPS module um, on the wiki for the 52pi.com, we can find the commands needed to set up the daemon. So we'll just scroll down a little bit. So we've done the sudo update. So what we need to do is the 
uh, sudo apt-get install gpsd client python gps. So we'll copy that and we'll go to the terminal session. Um, now Node-RED is running now in the background even though it was connected here it actually is running in the background. So we can execute this first command to install the gpsd client, the gpsd daemon and a python um, libraries of sorts. So we'll just run that. Okay, done. Now our instructions say we need to reboot the Raspberry Pi first and then we will uh, reconfigure the GPSD. So let's do that. It just takes a moment now with this new version of the Raspbian. The actual module is in a different room for me right now. I'm just remotely accessing it. In case you're wondering, I don't have it here to see, so I'll just give it a few uh, seconds to reboot, and then we'll try and reconnect again. Okay. Now we'll log back in again. So we now need to just execute the um, reconfigure. So I'm just copying these straight from the um, wiki page. and start the service. And there we go. Uh, we can kill it too if you want to. Now, what we should be able to do now is run CP, CGPS to um, get information from the module. Now whether this works or not I don't know but let's just give it a go. Well, uh, first time around I tried this it actually was giving me some errors or it wasn't actually reading it properly. Um, I think it may have been because I had the board rate wrong but let's just see if this works. So there we go it's come up but it doesn't look like it's reading anything here. We've seen that it's actually outputting via TTY USB. Oh, unless we lost that. I don't think we actually set that as a permanent fixture for the speed, did we? Ah, there we go. Look at that. See? It's uh, lost the fact that it's running at 9600 boards, so we need to reset that. There we go. So STTY dash big F slash dev slash TTY USB zero uh, space 9600 board. Let's enter that. Now we should be able to. Um, get data which we can so now if we run sudo cgps we should get something showing up on here so still had some problems of that so what I'm going to do is quickly check the Adafruit site who happens to have a very similar uh, GPS module works the same way and everything else just it happens to come on a uh, different kind of header board so I just want to see if there's any differences or a uh, potential fix for this. So sudo update, that's the same, that's the same. Uh, Raspbian Jesse system D service fixes here. So system control, start, let's go through here, try this. Just trying this to see if it actually works any better. Now we need to use USB 0, of course. This is using a slightly different version. So we'll put that in, see if this works. And GPS mon. So that still is not working. Oh, no, sorry. My mistake. Now it is. All right, looks like the uh, screen is misbehaving a little bit. I'm using PuTTY right now. Let me just stop PuTTY and bring up a uh, different terminal program. See if that helps. I'm going to use TerraTerm. So, Pi, Raspberry.
and yeah, let's so let's just run GPS demon. There we go. That looks a little better. So it looks like we are getting data. Let's go and see if we can get Node Red to run. So here's Node Red. Let's just refresh this. Up oh, there it is, right there. I wonder if that was there before as well. Anyway, so for the GPS, we should be able to just literally bring it on the screen. Uh, let's take a debug so we can just look at what's coming out of it. We'll just feed it into there. This is not a lesson on Node Red. Uh, local host would be correct, and it's on the default port for GPS daemon on 2947. So we say done, and uh, we'll say deploy. That's already now done. And we go to debug. We should be getting information. There we go. Let's stop the debug and expand one of these and see what information we've got. So it's type TPV. Um, we're in mode one, which actually means that it does not have a signal. It's in idle mode, so it's waiting for a signal. And that's everything. So that seems to be talking quite happily to that. So now let's um, try connecting to the analog to digital converter. Now this is using the ADS1115 module, so let's bring that on the screen here. Um, let's just clear our debug window. And what we will do for this, let's have a look inside. So we can tell it we have the ADS1115, not the 1015. Uh, default device is what we need, default address is what we need, and we're going to look at channel 0 to start with. Um, and these two, the gain here is actually not the gain. Well, it is the gain, but it's actually the value it's showing you is the full scale millivolts that is being supported. So it's adjusting the gain to give you that. So you can see you can go up to 6.144 volts. So what we got here is 4.096 volts. Um, and we got samples per second 128. Um, so that looks good for looking at channel zero. So let's just say done. Uh, now this is a node that needs to be triggered on an interval. So let's just grab an inject module, hook it up to the input to trigger it, and we'll tell it to um, repeat interval every one second, probably enough. Um, it doesn't really matter what we send into it, we're just trying to trigger it. So let's just say done there. And let's put another debug output on here, just so we can see what comes out of there. That should be sufficient. Let's just say OK. That's done now. And oh, there we go. There's our value 1249.75. So let's just put another one on here. Um, we'll trigger it as well. But you can't read all of these at this exact same time. So let's just throw in a, a little delay in here as well, maybe uh, just 100 milliseconds. We'll do that right after this one and feed that. Let's just change this to be, uh, let's make it um, 50 milliseconds delay. Okay, um, and we'll put another debug unit up so that we can independently look at them. Um, we want to configure this for a 1115 and channel 1 this time. Uh, we'll leave everything else exactly the same. So we'll say done and done. Uh, turn this one off. Let's just clear this so we can see what we're getting. So on channel 2, we got 1249. On channel 1, we have now got a different value. Okay, so that seems to be working fundamentally. What I'm going to do now is go and hook up a um, precision voltage source, and I'll put in uh, 2.5 volts to see what we can get. Just be right back. Okay, so I've just hooked up a precision DC voltage load from one of my friends in the UK. Uh, I will provide the link in the description to his device. Uh, Ian Scott Johnson designed and provided one to me um, 
earlier in the year and it's providing to be very very useful and very accurate and right now I'm inputting 2.5 volts to the ADC and as you can see here it's giving us a very accurate 2.499 um, volts reading so that's very very good so that's the ADC that we're now uh, reading from uh, via node red from the ADC on the I2C bus at port 48 that's working very very well so that's the two things we've got the, the display that we've already looked at so I'm just gonna stop the video recording right now and I'm gonna see if I can quickly put together a more interesting um, set of controls. I'll quickly walk you through them once I'm done but just to show you what you can do with these two devices and node red very very easily. So I'll be right back. Okay so I finished changing and adding to the node red display and what I've done here on the 5 inch LCD screen is I've brought up the browser and I have simply made it run full screen with the display. So what I've got on this left screen is the first one is connected to the thermistor and if I put my finger on there I'm not sure if you'll be able to notice it but it's just dropping just a little bit or changing it on the first one the second one is connected to my uh, precision voltage reference over here it's currently set to 2.5 volts and uh, so if I can get both of those in screen together there we go so I'm going to change this to um, 4 volts and we should see this one now that seems to be because the rest of these are floating it seems to be changing them but that is now reading 3.8 volts on there which doesn't seem right put it back to 2.5 and they seem to be reading okay there Anyway, you can see here, slight issue, as I said, this is not about node red, this is about using the ADC ADS1115. So, uh, as you can see here, we are reading the voltages correctly, uh, right now I've got the two volts going in, and we're reading exactly 2000 millivolts on here, on the bottom scale. Um, the chart is also reading 2000. The GPS, because we're still in the basement, is not reading anything. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to disconnect the precision voltage source and I'm going to take this upstairs without the display and sit it somewhere where it can actually detect GPSs and we'll connect to Node Red remotely. Okay, a couple of seconds gone by for you guys, about an hour for me, and here I have some now updates. So what we have here is the ADS1115 channel 0, 1, 2, and 3 set up. Uh, I've got a pulse coming in triggering a read for each channel. That is then going through a function which will basically just round off the values being read and is then being displayed to a gauge on, on one of the dashboard controls. I've set the scale from 0 to 5000 because as you saw the output from the um, ADCs is basically oh, it's not re it's not reading from there right now um, is going from 0 to 4096 so the ADC reading is actually factoring in what is happening with the channel and giving us the correct output in millivolts so that should give us one two three four graphs or four um, gauges should I say I've also set up a uh, bar graph a bar chart that should take the four channels worth of data as well and put them on a bar for us to have a look at so the other part of this is for the GPS module and what I've done here is I've taken the GPS data which we saw coming in before um, as you can see here right now on node red, there's even a status to say that it's got a three-dimensional fix, which means that me putting it upstairs has worked. It's now got a number of satellites um, and with enough of them that it can even figure out the altitude. I've put it through a switch control to split out the various um, messages that come from the GPS. The one that we're interested in is, in this case, the TPV 
which is the transport position and velocity information. I think that's what TPV stands for. I can't remember. Anyway, um, that's what's coming through, and we're feeding it to um, three text boxes, one that is dealing with latitude, one for longitude, and one for altitude. And we also feed the data into a little bit of a script. So if it says mode one, uh, which is what we were looking at before, then the text will say no fix, which is what we saw when we looked at it uh, before I moved it upstairs. If it's mode two, then it's two dimensional. If it's mode three, then we're in a three dimensional. And as you can see over here, it's indicating that we are actually seeing a three dimensional fix, which is good. Um, this other control is an, um, an node that I downloaded and it will actually show us a world map and allow us to actually zoom in. So what I've done is I've set up a name just says hello. Um, I've set the zoom factor to 13 um, in the script which it means it's just adding to the data that's coming in and I've in the world map I've told it no other information except to auto pan to whatever the coordinates are and the zoom factor is. So once it gets a fix and it receives some data, then we should be able to see it on the map and it should tell me where the GPS is, which of course is where I live. So that's all of the information plugged in here. <clears throat> and we'll just hit deploy. Now if we go to debug and turn on the messages, and just get a couple of those, let's just expand one of these out now. You can see here that we actually have the device, USB 0, we've got the time now accurate, um, the latitude, the longitude, and an altitude. Now right now it thinks it's at minus 43 meters, which is actually not correct, but it might just need more satellites to get a proper fix, who knows. Um, the latitude and longitude is correct though. So if we um, first of all, we'll look at what is being shown and the GPS dashboard screen. So I have one ready here already. Um, I showed you a moment ago on the small screen. This is the exact same web page, just shown on a larger screen. So you can see here, um, this channel zero is the one that has the um, thermistor connected to it. The other three are just floating, so they're sitting about 570 millivolts. Um, but the GPS now has got coordinates, latitude, longitude, and altitude. Uh, and it also knows that it's in 3D mode. I just refresh that. Yeah, it's still negative altitude for whatever reason. Not sure why, but I think that's something to do with the GPS module. Perhaps, um, let's just go back and have a look at the data that is coming out of it. Um, altitude, yeah, it's actually saying minus 43. So it might need a restart. I just um, reconnected everything up there. It, just, it might need just longer to get more satellites and a better fix. And so that's the dashboard. Now the world map one, let's just bring that up. So it should be uh, 192.168.1.143 colon 1880 slash world map, I think. Oh, so I spell it correctly. There we go. And you saw that first screen come up and then it automatically switched and zoomed in to pretty much where I live. And there's the little node that was added to this and it says hello. Now you can actually take data from a number of different GPSs and potentially, um, you know, if I just zoom in on Toronto here, for example, um, here's the 401. Here's where I am. Sorry, because the data keeps feeding to it very quickly, it resumed the map back to where the tag comes in. But if you had a number of different um, vehicles moving around in an area, you could actually track them quite easily from their GPS data. So there's a very simple use for something like this. We're using Node-RED 
a simple GPS module and um, you know you could have that module hooked up to pretty much anything because it's using a USB com device so you could use an IoT 2020 uh, Raspberry Pi or anything else so pretty cool anyway um, I just wanted to just demonstrate that so that was a very quick piece of um, node red design that I did there just to show you what's going on uh, and how easy it is to take these modules from um, 52pi.com and use them in something practical. Um, obviously the world map one, if you make yourself a little edge device that's transmitting via uh, phone system or Wi-Fi or um, Sigfox or whatever else it is, as soon as you've got the data into Node Red, you can do things like show where that GPS is located on a world map. If you're using the eight, the ADS1115, then you can show all of the data up on a nice pretty graph or as a gauge. Uh, this could be part of a process engineering or something like that. And through the use of some simple scripting, which you can just put in, say, these function blocks, which right now is very minimal, but you can just write some JavaScript in here to make decisions based on what the uh, value of the data is. So maybe you can turn on a fan if it's measuring temperature. Uh, maybe it's the level of fluid in a tank. You could turn off a valve, whatever you want. Um, this is just a sort of proof of concept to show you how easy it is to use these devices. The display, as you saw, that even at five inches in size, makes quite a reasonable display for showing something like the node red uh, dashboard it actually displayed quite nicely there and you know it's very easy even with a finger with a small screen to be able to uh, pick the menus and navigate around it obviously if you've got really really small text that'd be a lot harder but you know it's all about designing your screens to suit what you're trying to look at so anyway um, I think that they seem to be quite good value for money I'll provide the links in the description and um, that's pretty much it. Hope to see you on the next video soon. And if you have any questions, please post them in the comments and I'll try and answer them for you. Anyway, that's it for now. So, bye.